Japanese artist and entrepreneur Takashi Murakami has recently come to reconquer the headlines in his collaborations with numerous mass media artists. The new album of J Balvin, Colores, will be featuring a cover designed by Murakami and his already well-known flowers. Other past collaborations include the fashion firm Louis Vuitton or the more recent video he animated for Billie Eilish's single You Should See Me in a Crown. Perhaps the collaboration of an artist like Murakami with the mass media idols or fashion designers may still come as surprising despite this not being the only artist that has done so. But to understand Murakami as well as this phenomenon, we must first understand two key figures in the equation. The often misread and controversial Frankfurt school theorist Theodore Adorno and the twisted and obscure history of Japanese anime. Let's start with the second one. After the Second World War, with the occupation of Japan by the American military forces, and with the impossibility of developing an army of its own, Japan entered an obsessive path towards economic and industrial power that turned what was a completely ruined country by the half of the 20th century into one of the most powerful nations in the globe in just about 20 years. Japanese society became quickly adapted to this new commodity and social well-being, and the concept of the salaryman was naturalized. Studying hard to quickly get a salary job would be seen as the pinnacle of a happy, honorable and productive life. But it wasn't that simple. As this idea consolidated in Japanese society, schools would get ever more competitive and youngsters would be bearing an unbelievable pressure to succeed. Apart from remarkable grades, joining a club was a must, mostly orbitating around sports, thus forcing part of the students to find creative ways to avoid this situation. The solution they came with came in form of newly established culture clubs. Many otaku, a term that was mostly used as an insult, similar to the way the term freak is employed in the West today, would quickly fill these newly formed culture clubs in which interest in manga and anime were common, creating a new spectator group which would evolve from a previous small childlike identity into the introduction of action and characters with a subtle sexual charge. Dragon Ball is just as an example. For more in-depth comments on this I can only recommend Hiroki Asuma's text Otaku. Japan's database animals. However, throughout these years, the social pressure on young students and recent graduates, and the difficulty of finding a real, long-lasting contract and well-paid job became unbearable for many, some of whom started developing a new life indoors, hopeless, cynic, and depressing, without living for extended periods from weeks, months, and in some cases, even years. They came to be known as Hikikomori. Throughout the 80s and 90s, this renowned characteristics of anime parallel to the founding of successful agents like Studio Ghibli would start calling the attention of Westerners with still somehow more childlike oriented productions. Back in Japan, although not the primary target of anime, the Hikikomori would start influencing the new anime production, purchasing videos, comic books, and other marketing products based on the favorite CD. The monstrous, the weird, fantastic and often violent would start consolidating. It is also no wonder that this era would see the boom of erotic content like Asume Hideo Sibel in 1979 and Uratsuhitoshi La Blue Girl by the end of the decade, as well as the rise of pornographic cartoons known as hentai. Of course we're not going to cover that here, but I'm sure you can find your way to this field of study yourselves. So what has Theodore Adorno have to do with all this? In his text The Dialectic of Enlightenment, co-authored by Max Horkheimer, Adorno called attention to the concept of the culture industry, the phenomenon in which cultural products in the capitalist societies start being driven by marketing and consumerism, often in factory-like production numbers. This calls our attention back to Murakami, an artist whose most famous works consist on handbags, apparel and pins blurring every frontier between art, the popular culture of anime, and marketing. It is no secret that the work of Murakami came as a burlesque critique of the narrow-minded Westerners and their preconceptions of Japanese culture, as has been openly defended by Murakami himself. Thus, most of Murakami's works consist of mere mass-produced designs devoid of any concept, empty as the symbols of Nike or Adidas. It should be then no wonder that Murakami is up to collaboration with the mass media agents. He is a mass media agent himself, utilizing its languages and mediums for decades, and still celebrated as the face of Japanese contemporary art after the fall of the superplan the anime influence movement that he created, taking place already decades ago.